Good morning, it's Michael Lipinski again. It's about six o'clock. You see where, uh, how we're turning. So I wanted to get right back into this because uh, time is of the essence. So this uh, particular exercise, we're going to continue along uh, using content. There's a lot to this. There's a lot to it. Uh, using content. Effective use of content is all about repeated elements. In a hierarchy, project family type instance that you put in your Revit project to develop and document your design. Content can often maintain relationships with other content. More important, they maintain relationships to datum objects. As you can see from the Revit organizational chart shown previously, content includes system families, component families, and spaces. So let's take a look at that. So you can see the project organization it consists of system families, component families, and spaces. So as you see, um, the system families um, can consist of uh, lots of different things. These families can, can, can be, they could be text families, they could be um, built-in families, uh, customizable families. Uh, an AutoCAD user would, would think of them as blocks. Um, similar, not the same, but similar. Um, as you can see, uh, all these uh, component families, doors, windows, all these components, MEP, architecture, structural, um, um, are considered content that we're going to be putting into the model. Um, system families, also called host families, are content that is part of the regic project environment and are more akin to rules, rule sets rather than physically constructed components. These families are not created and stored in external RFAs. RFA extension. A project file would be an RVT. A family file would be an RFA with an RFA extension. That's the difference between the two as far as file naming conventions are concerned. So, and they're stored in external files as RFAs. They're found only in the RVT project file. Um, if you need another type of system family, you will duplicate an existing type from within the project. System families can be 3D elements such as walls, floors, roofs, ceilings, stairs, and railings, or 2D elements such as text, dimensions, revision, bubbles, and insulation. So these things are kind of built into it. Um, what it's saying is that um, more often than not, you can uh, use an existing system family and modify it to your needs or your firm's needs, um, in addition to having all the families that you can create independently of that. Uh, these are kind of like built into the system. Uh, but they do have... Uh, you can, they're starting to put together wall components and roof components that actually are families um, that, are, that operate independently from the uh, internal system families that it comes with. Um, different companies are, are developing software so that their products can interact and be loaded into projects because uh, they're all trying to be COVID compliant. This includes wall systems, roof systems, floor systems, uh, compound ceiling systems, glazing systems, anything you can think of. And that goes into construction of a, of a project or construction of a, of a component. Um, and, and these families don't have to be architecture. This could be a pump. This could be an electrical switchgear uh, bay. It could be, it could be anything. Pull box, uh, millwork, well, you name it, it could be it. Because, again, these, these families that we're going to be loading, uh, as you can see, the, in the architectural aspect of it, there could be uh, a few of them. And again, this is more of an architecture than an MEP. I'm going to sprinkle in some MEP. But MEP, uh, M Revit MEP is for another class. Um, the mechanical, plumbing, HVAC, and electrical. I teach those classes as well. But this is, we're going to focus on architecture. Because we're going to be in the construction end or the contractor end. You really should know what the contract or what the architect's up to. <laughs> Because they're really good at this. And you are going to have to conform to their changes. Tin goes in for a spaces of the essence. And, and space is money. The more space you have, the more money you're going to be able to extract from your, from your model. Anyway, so I don't want to go off on a tangent. But um, this is actually kind of cool. Creating custom families. Um, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. There's a lot you can do with it. Now, we're not going to get into that in this chapter, but we will. We're going to create some pretty cool um, system, uh, we're going to modify some system families, and we're going to create our own loadable families, uh, and you're going to enjoy that. And again, you have to keep an open mind. 
these components are also MEP components. I, when they're talking about components, there's absolutely no reason why they're not talking about structural components. Beams, columns, walls, floors, all these, all these, all these different components, um, ducts, pipes, trays, fixtures, devices, all of these, um, these elements, these families, uh, are components and you can create them in the only limits of your imagination. So, as you see from that chart, you know, content includes system families, component families, and spaces. And there are spaces that are playing into that, into this. You'll see that you know, elements uh, are organized into model elements and annotation elements, and then you have host elements, component, uh, component elements, view elements, data elements, annotation elements, and it's, a, it's a, an organized hierarchy of how this actually works, whereas host elements are built in place construction, such as slabs, walls, roofs, stairs, and ramps, and then component families, everything else in your model, doors, windows, furniture, equipment, beams, columns, electrical devices, ducts, pipes, sprinkles, air terminals, view elements, uh, the way you see and interact with things in Revit, view, views interact with all other elements, floor plans, ceiling plans, structural plans, tree views, elevation, sections, schedules, quantities, legends, drafting views, and then again, we discussed this earlier, the datum elements, non-physical items used to establish project context, levels, column grids, reference planes, reference lines, um, sections, call-outs, all sorts of things. And then we have the annotation elements, uh, continuing with um, 2D components that maintain scale on paper and are only visible in one view. Uh, dimensions, tech note, uh, text notes, tags, symbols. Now, Revit uses a mechanism uh, called family to manage information related to elements. They are, uh, there are system families stored within a project. These things, these, these um, families um, are stored in the project. And the project is a .rvt extension. And component families are stored externally in separate Revit family files, or RFA files. Um, examples of family tree, uh, there's the element, and then the family, and then the type, and then the instance. So, and that's what I want to talk to you about uh, right from the get-go, because the first thing it said was effective use of contents is all about repeated elements in a hierarchy, project family type instance. And if you, the element itself was a wall, the family may be a basic wall, the type may be exterior brick on concrete masonry unit, and then the instance is the actual user-drawn wall in the project. Um, and the same example uh, of, a, of, a, of a door element, um, and the family is doors, exterior double flush, it's a component family, type 1810 by 2010, 2110 millimeters, uh, actual user drawn door in project. It's an instance of that type. And, and the reason being is that you're going to have multiple ways of controlling the visibility and the, the, the display representation of, of these, these elements. And that is one of the toughest things to master in this software is display representation. Can you get it to look the right way and be code compliant? Uh, it's not easy, but it's, it's, uh, it's not insurmountable. If you put in the effort, you'll be able to do this. If you can just wash your hands and say, ah, I do AutoCAD, you're going to find that you may not last over time at doing it. The uh, industry may choose to uh, exclude you from the next generation, banish you from the herd, excommunicate you into the wall, into the room of lost souls. It's, it's not as intuitive. Get with, it, get with the program and get left behind. In any event. So... Uh, it is what it is. This is the Revit, Revit, um, Revit element organization, and again, uh, we're going to continue on verbatim. Systems families, system families, also called host families, are content that is part of the Revit project environment and are more akin to rule sets rather than physically constructed components. These families are not created and stored in external files. They're found only in the RVT project file. If you need another type of, of a system family, you will duplicate an existing type from within the project. System families can be 3D elements such as walls, floors, roofs, ceilings, stairs, and railings, uh, or 2D elements such as text, dimensions, revision bubbles, and insulation. Component families are created in the family editor are either 2D or 3D content. This means you will have to create and load these kinds of families outside the Revit project environment as RFA files. 
When you start to create a component family, you will need to select appropriate family templates. By selecting the right family template, you will be certain that the component you're creating is going to behave, view, schedule if necessary, and export promptly, including, um, I'm sorry, although most system families help shape the physical aspects of a building, the occupied voids within are critical to a successful, successful design. These elements are spaces, which take the form of rooms and areas. Spaces maintain relationships to datum objects, but also to model elements, including floors, walls, ceilings, and roofs. In addition to spatial properties, rooms are used to document finishes within your project. Take a look at the properties of room, and you will find floor finish, base finish, wall finish, and ceiling finish. Now, let's stop right there. I've got some drafting to do. Modeling, I should say. That's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. It really literally is. Actions speak louder than words. So let's go to Revit for a second. Let's just go to the floor plan. Now, so it's talking about a lot of things. The first thing, again, I showed you was the Revit organization chart and this and that. But um, you have to understand that we're in a, a project right now. We're in an RVT, RVT project. And as you can see, in this RVT project, wall start, it does come included with some um, families, loadable families that are already loaded. And then you'll see there's a system family down here. This is the system family. A wall would be a good example of a system family. Within that, that wall, we have, we have types. Let's think about that for a second. Let's look at the hierarchy. Okay? We have wall, the element is the wall. The family is basic wall. The type is exterior brick and the instance. So it's element, family, type, instance. Element, family, type, instance. Element, family, Type, and then here is the instance. I don't like that shape. Let's do it like this. Now, so you can see we placed an instance of a wall. And then there it is. So now, it's not a space, it's a wall. There's, no, there's not a space yet. Because we haven't done anything, we haven't included a space. But let's take a look at what a space actually does. So you go to the Analyze tab. This is one of the most important aspects of it. You'll see that there's spaces and zones, and there's things that we can do. Now, we're not going to get into all this just yet, but we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to do this uh, the right way. So let's start with a floor. Let's get a, uh, let's go to the architecture. Let's go to a, a floor. And let's just hover over. Creates a floor for the current level of the building model. To align the floors with existing walls, use the pick walls tool. Or to sketch the floor boundaries, draw lines or pick existing lines of the model. The floor is, off, is offset downward from the level on which it is created. And we can get into that. Um, so let's actually pick that tool. And you can see, if you pick the, it's, it's asking you to pick walls to create lines. And a contextual toolbar opens up. And within that contextual uh, ribbon, you'll see all of these tools, um, inclusive of some geometry uh, tools, because you're about to place a, a floor. And you could do it just like we do with the architectural uh, walls. Um, we could do it lots of different ways. Um, but we're going to, this is for another time, so I'm going to do it really quick. So I'm just going to just pick all these walls and then just hit, Yes, and now I have a floor. And if you look at it, it's a generic floor. It's only 12 inches. And like they said, if you go to the elevation view, the, the, it goes down. So it's the, the top of it is level one. And if you look, um, the thickness is in the negative direction. So as you can see, um, it's not offset from level, um, but it is a, a generic 12-inch wall. Now, I really don't want to jump ahead, but if I went into the type of this instance, I would notice that if I decided to change anything in the type properties, then anywhere I use this type of floor, the parameters would change for all of them, not just that instance. And then that is indeed the, the trick. You can change everything all at once if you decide to make some changes on the fly. But if you wanted to change this as at just this instance of it, you'd have to duplicate it. And then change its parameters so that it's a unique wall, a floor, as opposed, uh, so it doesn't change the, well, every floor you made in the project. And we're going to get into that. 
um, into all of these parameters and properties. But as you can see, as you can see, here's our, our, our floor. And again, I'll just do a quick uh, edit to get an idea. The uh, structure default thickness is 12. Now, if I went to the structure of this, you could see the thickness is 12. If I change the six thickness to 6 inches, watch the floor in the left-hand view. Hit apply. You'll see that it went up 6 inches from its negative 12 base point. And then therein, is this, it's not that hard. <laughs> so I'm going to undo that, leave it at 12 inches. And you have to understand something. There are lots of different floor types. There are lots of different floor types. And I'm going to show you that there are lots of different uh, families that you, could, you can do. Now, again, I, don't, I hate to get ahead, but anyone who's maybe a little savvy with this can appreciate this, that as I selected this floor within the context of selecting it, the contextual toolbar opened up with some options uh, and some tools that we could use. And as you can see, there are some things we could do to this floor, inclusive of pitch. <laughs> so I was letting you watch this video for a second. Manipulate points and edges on a selected slab roof or floor to adjust the vertical offset between the vertices and the original top face of the slab. Change the elevation value on the options bar, and you'll see that you can do lots of different things with floors, slabs, roofs. And this, um, this is a, it's an amazing intuitive software platform. It was designed by architects, engineers, uh, for architects and engineers. <laughs> you know, it was designed for them. That's what they demanded the software do so that they can compete. So, again, we, we're going to get into all this. We're going to be drawing using all these tools. We got a lot to cover. That's why I'm, I'm spastic. Again, I only have, I had a year's worth of rent for free. I haven't been able to find work. Okay, I was working at Kennedy. I got the boot. Okay, time's running out for me. I'm, I'm giving everything I got. I'm hoping, you know, this has some reach. And when this crisis is over, I can stay in this really nice luxury apartment that I have. It's either that, or I'm going to be on the street again. So, what would you do if you too had a free year's worth of rent? Actually, six months. What would you two do if you were me? Can I call a friend? I need some advice. All right, so, using content. Now, let's go back to the floor plan for a second before I go off on a tangent uh, and start begging everyone for money. All right, so I'm just going to get rid of this arc wall here so I can keep this aesthetically pleasing. And, um... I don't know. I'm not really happy with this shape. I want to just do some things with it real quick. All right. Yeah, that's a little better. I'll take that. All right. Now, so, again, component families are, are created in the family editor and are either 2D, 3D content. This means you will have to create and load these kinds of families outside the Revit project environment as RFA files, and that's what we do right now. So, now, again, these walls and everything are all Nice, and they're already ready to go. What if you need to load something, something custom that you want to put in? Let's, let's, start, let's start with the door. Now, look right off the bat. I hit the door command, and no door families loaded in the project. Would you like to load one now? Sure. So if I go here, it automatically defaults to this directory. Now, this is important. Look at this directory tree for a second. Desktop, this PC, operating system, program data, Autodesk RVT 2020 Libraries U.S. Imperial Doors. Now, don't mess around with this. This is where your families go. Don't, don't think, yeah, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. It's designs in this directory hierarchy. You start fucking around with it, everything gets all screwed up. So let's take a look at the U.S. Imperial, the U.S. Imperial families that are loaded with the out-of-the-box Revit um, 2018 tutorial version. And so, as you can see, there's a whole plethora of items, uh, generic. These are ones that um, you have to keep in these directory structures. Here's U.S. Imperial. And then if you go up to metric, yeah, you, have, you have metric as well, your metric. You'll see all these sizes are in metric. So let's just take a look at some of these in U.S. Imperial. Annotations, let's take a look. All customized, customized and customizable. These are just annotations. And we're going to get into this. This may be a little confusing for some of you, um, but annotations play an important part of it. It's a lot of information you have to convey. You have to extract from these families and display in schedules. 
And, and they have to maintain a bidirectional um, relationship with a lot of other things because you're designing a system. And if you change to one system, it's going to be a change. It could be a change, uh, plus or minus, uh, to within the entire system framework. So that's why I stress that, that uh, these loadable families, and let's look at some of them. We gotta, let's just do something simple, furnishers, a furnisher. And again, you can get a lot of these forever families downloadable from manufacturers' websites, but right out of the bat, right out of the bat, the box comes with a few, uh, right out of the box it comes with a few, TV stands, some beds, you know, some simple stuff. Here's a bunk bed. I could use seven of these. Let's just put a bunk bed in here. Some or all the family types you select can be loaded. You must choose family types of the category doors because I click doors. Um, do you want to retry loading a new set of files? Uh, sure. Anyway, I, I, I digressed. It wants me to put in a door. So let's put in a quick door. So you go down to the U.S. Imperial. You get doors. You see there's so many. Let's take a look at some, some commercial doors. We have a revolving one. We got double revolving glass. Two light. Let's just do a two light door. And again, you can see the types, specify types. The family, I'll show you what the family that I selected, Oops. is a door exterior side, single, two light, RFA, family. <coughs> Within that family, there are types, and they're based on sizes. As you can see, width and height. And there's more parameters to them, I'll show you them once I select it. So let's just put in this big 48 by 96 door, eight foot in height, um, and let's click it. And now you'll notice the wall is going to host the door. And this is where, this is where AutoCAD, it just it falls way short. So as I hover around, obviously I can't place it anywhere. I can't place it here, but once I touch, go near this wall, it's going to want, I haven't clicked yet, but it's going to want to put it somewhere. And it's going to cut the geometry. Let's just center it right here as best as we can. Let's have it swing out. Boom. Now it cut the geometry. And if anyone who ever, who's ever used AutoCAD knows that that in itself is a huge, huge thing, considering that when you move it, it maintains its relationship with the wall. That's huge. Um, and again, being that this is hosted by this wall, and everything is actually I haven't. Remember the the the, um, the floor is hosted by the, uh, the wall, and, the, and we haven't done it yet, we did it in the other exercise, but um, this, this floor is, could be constrained to a level, just as this wall is relatively constrained within certain parameters to this wall. Now notice pick new host, uh, edit family, the door is selected, and I can, I can host it somewhere else. It's hosted on this wall, I can host it over here. I host it over here. Um, now, if you take a look at the door properties, now you'll notice here is the door family. And if you wanted to edit the type, if you have multiple instances of this door in the model, every time you edit this type and the parameters of this type, you'll find that every single door that is of the door exterior single two light 48 by 36 type will change. And again, as you could see, there are a lot of properties that are associated with this and parameters that you can add, that you could add. These are customizable. All of these parameters come with the door, but that doesn't mean you can't add new ones. And you may have to. And again, I'm not going to get in to all of this, but any carpenter would appreciate the way this is set up. And I would strongly suggest anyone that's interested that puts in doors for and windows for a living, take a look at this. You might, buy, might find something that's of value to you. I'm not saying you go out and design you know, skyscrapers, but there's absolutely no reason why anyone couldn't take this software without knowing as much as they think they should know and be able to put together a small model, bring it out to City Hall, and I, I should see it somewhere in this town. This isn't difficult to do. Uh, the smaller the structure, the easier it is. The larger, obviously, the harder it is. But a single family, a two family home shouldn't be very, very difficult utilizing the software to create it. It should be done uh, head and shoulders faster than, than, than the normal methods and practices. Design what you want. This will make it faster. It'll make it happen faster. Again, I could be talking out of my ass. All right, so again, all of these, all of these uh, systems 
I'm, I'm sorry, all of these um, families can be loaded in. Now, we talked about components. Again, if you wanted to insert something, again, you could, on the architectural tab, you'll have the ability to uh, insert components, places an element in the building model based on a selected element type. Use the drop-down list to select the element type. If the desired type is not listed, use the load family to load it into the project. Then click the drawing area to place elements of that type in the building model. So that's exactly what we'll do. Now you can you can actually model in place, almost like a in place family editor, um, or you could actually um, no component is loaded. So same thing, you can load an architectural component. And again, all of these different types of architectural components. And let's rattle them off. Annotations, boundary conditions, cable tray, casework, columns, conduit, curtain panel by pattern, curtain wall panels, detail items, doors, duct, electrical, entourage, people, people, entourage, fire protection, furniture, furniture systems, lighting, mass, mechanical, openings, pipe, planting, plumbing, profiles, railing, site, specialty equipment, Structural columns, structural connections, structural foundations, structural framing, structural rebar couplers, structural rebar shapes, structural retaining walls, structural stiffness, structural trusses, sustainable, sustainable design, system families, title blocks, windows. Now, remember I told you you duplicate the existing system families? Well, that's where you would put them. Okay, so now. Now we have, and as you can see in the project browser, all the families that came loaded with this project are already in here. Now remember we said doors weren't loaded when we first opened one? Well, there is one now because I loaded it, and there it is. I could delete it from here, and that door is going to be gone. It's gone. So it's a very intuitive platform. It's a very intuitive platform. Um, so let's continue on. Although most system families help shape the physical aspects of a building, the occupied voids within are critical to success successful design. These elements are spaces, which take the form of rooms and areas. Space may, uh, maintain relationships to datum objects, but also to model elements. This is going to blow you away, including floors, walls, ceilings, and hosts uh, and roofs. In addition to spatial properties, rooms are used to document finishes within your project. Take a look at the properties of a room, and you'll find floor finish, base finish, wall finish, and ceiling finish. Well. I haven't created a room yet. I've created some geometry, but I haven't created anything analytical. So let's do that. Let's go to the level one floor plan. Let's take a look. Now, we could, we're in the architectural tab, and you'll see room, room separator, tag area, tag area. Um, now, I'm not going to do that yet. First, I'm going to go to the analyze tool, and I'm going to create a, a space. Places analytical spaces to account for the entire volume within the model. This includes rooms, plenums, and chases. To, play, to use space bounding elements in a linked file, use the room bounding parameter in the type properties of the linked model. After you place the space, it's added to the default zone. You should assign each space to a zone. This removes the space from the default zone. And this is where Johnson Controls and all those other fancy schmancy companies come in. Now, because you can monitor the temperature of the room, a heat detector. Uh, anyway, that was one example. I just woke up. Um, it, it said um, to use space bounding elements in a link file. What if the architect sends you a model and there aren't any spaces? Guess what? You're going to have to create them if you want to derive information out of it. So let's do that. And you're going to argue, you'll have to argue with the architect about that. Whether he's going to give you, he or she's going to give you the spaces, or you have to create them yourselves. Now let's just do that. So let's place an analytical space. Now before I do it, again notice that within the context of invoking the space command, you'll notice that modify place space menu opened up a ribbon that actually gave us some other tools within the context of this command to manipulate it transparently while we're performing the function, and they include. Place spaces automatically, which is very, very handy. Uh, place space in all closed and bounded areas on the current level. Clicking this tool automatically creates names and numbers, spaces for enclosed area greater than a quarter of an inch. I'm sorry, a quarter of a foot. And number of spaces for enclosed areas greater than a quarter of a square foot. Um, areas containing a room component are specified as occupiable. Spaces are created on the current level according to the parameters in the option bar. And here they are. Level, upper limit, Limit offset, base offset, average estimated illuminance, or lux. <laughs> uh, 
room cavity ratio, lighting calculation work plane, lighting calculation luminaire plane, ref uh, ceiling reflectance, wall reflectance, floor reflectance, design HVAC load per area, um, uh, design other, lo uh, other load per area, and then there's obviously going to be the area computation. All it knows right now is that when I do place it, it's going to be 10 foot high. Doesn't mean I, have to ch I could change that. I could change that. Um, and you'll see how this can, can, will help you. Um, computation height, not calculated yet. Not calculated yet. Specified supply airflow. All you gearheads are going to love this shit. <laughs> all you HVAC mechanical guys or girls, right up your alley. Specified supply airflow, blah, blah, blah. Calculated supply airflow. Actual supply airflow in cubic feet minute. Return airflow specified. Again, supply, specified supply, calculated supply, airflow. And again, this is all going into how you design your system. A constant air volume, variable air volume, way beyond the, 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 the scope of this conversation. But it's going to be based on design um, and flow and all that good stuff. Now you can see these, these are some parameters that you can assign. And the, based on the equipment, you know, what, what size air handler unit, all that is going to play into all these calculations. So we're not going to get into all the, the engineering side of it uh, and the science of thermodynamics just yet. Um, but let's just take a look at what else here. So identity data is going to be called the space. It's going to be called the space. A room number, it, it's, it's, it's unoccupied at the time. It's not a room yet. We haven't even created a space yet. But you can see how now something placed or hosted within this room, within this zone, within this space, now it knows where it is. It's addressable, if you will. So you can derive and schedule parameters from it. And it'll do it automatically. So let's just take a look again at energy analysis real quick. Obviously, it's not in the zone yet. It'll put it in the default zone once we place it. And you'll see it in the systems browser. Um, I may be getting a little ahead of you, but this is something I just don't want to um, breeze over because a few of the classes that I had taught in the past, the, per the, the people that purchased the class demanded that I explained this to the students. And they made a point of it. They wanted them to know this. Um, so I took their uh, direction and said, okay, I'll do what you want. All right, so again, energy analysis, you can see, is this going to be a plenum space? Is this uh, what zone it's going to be in? It'll automatically assign it. And you'll be able to manipulate that. Is it occupiable? Well, we'll see. Um, no, it's condemned. This building is condemned. So the answer to that question is no. This is a haunted fucking house. This isn't real. This is fake. I'm lying to you. I don't know how to do this. All right, condition type, heating, heated and cooled. Unconditioned, vented, naturally vented only. All these things. And you can add these parameters. Space type. It's a building, right? Or is it? <laughs> what kind of space is it going to be? Is it going to be... Uh, what could it be? It could be... It could be a police station laboratory. And you'll notice that the parameter values will change based on AIA and Uniform Building Code standards. You'll notice that Judge's Chambers Courthouse has a different area per person. Um, so for every person that goes into the Judge's Chamber, they are required to have 21.53 square feet. For every person that goes into the police uh, where is it? The police station laboratory. You're allowed, for, you have to have 43.06 square foot per person. Occupancy, right? So, again, all of these spaces, um, patient room, hospital health care, you'll see that there are requirements that you need to change the air twice an hour. So all of these parameters and variables, uh, variables value, they are valuable, all of these variables play into all this. You can't arbitrarily just putz around. You can't putz around. You have to do it the correct way, or you're going to lose money, and you're going to be liable. Other televised playing areas, sports arena, office, nurse station. All right, so I gotta make, I gotta choose something. Let's make a nurse station because we need more nurses. All right, so it's a nurse station. Now look, as I hover the space around here, I can't really place it. No, because I place it outside, and the space is. It's not in a properly enclosed region. So it isn't, but it's a space. But as I bring it into the perimeter within the bounding wall, the wall bounding, you'll notice that it's looking for me to select it. Now, watch the zone in the properties palette. 
right here when I select it. Now you see it wasn't populated, but now if we go up to Systems Browser, we go to View, we go to User Interface, we turn on Systems Browser, and we take a look, you'll notice that if we went to Zones, there's two spaces, one, two. Now, the properties of the space obviously are right here. So now you'll see that these systems, no specific, all right, I'm not getting ahead of myself. I wanted to just show you that because it's important. It's really, really important. Um, because again, we're designing, or maybe um, the MEP designers, engineers, contractors, are designing systems. But this is how it's done. Um, and those systems will be here and be able to test them and simulate them and, and derive all sorts of pertinent data. All right, so that is the space. Notice that you can't really see it because it's, uh, it's non-selectable, but in this view, I could turn it on by going into visibility graphics within the view properties. And I'm not going to get into, into that right now because we're getting to that. Actually, soon. Visibility graphics is a whole other story. It's complicated. Um, so we're working with type and instance parameters, uh, and we're going off on a tangent. But uh, before we do that, let me go back to architecture, and let's consider this an area. It's also an area. It's on level one. Automatic create, automatically create area boundary lines associated with all external worlds, yes. So now this is an area. Okay, now you can create a room. No room tag family is loaded. So we have to load one. Let's go to a tag family. Program data US, annotations, architectural. Now you notice, you don't see room tags, but here's the trick. Sometimes they're here in the, the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, root directory. So we may have to search around a little bit. You don't want to have to be doing this all the time. But where is that room tag? There it is, room tag. Again, these tags have parameters that you can extract from them. So let's use the room tag, and you'll see it'll actually give it a tag. And now it's room one. So now let's go back to our systems, our zones, default, and there it is. So now when you schedule this, when you schedule this, you'll be able to, um, to, be able to extract some information out of this. Uh, let's just go to filter list by architecture. Let's just put a quick schedule in here so you can see what I'm talking about. If we go to, uh, let's see here, rooms. A room schedule. Schedule building components. Phase new construction. Uh, area. Let's just, do, let's just add fields that we want. I'm going to add all these fields to this room. I'm going to bring them over. And I'm going to hit OK. And now when we set our schedule, you'll notice that the area is 5,029 square foot. And you can see that there are, some there are some schedules that you can now put on and order your materials <laughs> like a human being would do from a spreadsheet. All right, I'm not going to get totally into that, but here's the schedule. You can, you know, there's templates you can make and all sorts of parameters, all bells and whistles you can add to this. Uh, horsepower. <laughs> Root means square stuff. I'm not going to get into all that just yet because I know I want to. So I'm going to keep it simple, stupid. Working with type and instance parameters. All content and Revit projects have parameters which are simple or simply the information or data about something. Parameters can affect many different aspects of a project such as visibility, behavior, size, shape, and material. To develop a fundamental understanding of parameters, you must note that there are two kinds of parameters, type and instance. Type parameters control every control information about every element of the same type. For example, if the material of a piece of furniture is designated as a type parameter, and you change it, the material for all furniture of that type uh, will change. Uh, and that's important. And this is the last thing we're going to do in this video. Instance parameters control only the instances that you have selected. So if the material of the piece of furniture that you have selected is an instance parameter, you'll be editing only the selected elements. Instance parameters can be constantly exposed in the property palette, constantly exposed in the properties palette. Selecting something initially displays the instance parameters. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, show the instance parameters of a wall that control the relative height, constraints, and structural usage real quick before, before we get out of here, um, because I have more to cover. 
Um, and we're going to get into that. And this is like a, a year's course all by itself, just this next section we're going to talk about. So let's go to the south elevation for a second. Let's take a look at this wall. Now, it's a basic wall, exterior brick on metal stud. Now, as you can see, there aren't many walls that are in here. You can see that we have a generic 6-inch, exterior CMU on metal stud, exterior brick on metal stud, which is what we have. This is, this is the curtain wall. So switching element type to curtain element, all inserts in the element will be deleted. I'm just going to hold that for a second. And now this is a curtain wall. And the same parameters. Uh, you could change a lot of the parameters within this. Let's take a look at it in 3D so you get a better idea what it looks like. And then you'll see that there's more to this. And this is just a cheap one. Nothing, uh, nothing fantastic about it. But there's so much you could do with this as far as mullions and glazing and design and styles. Let's take a look at this, this door here, this, this wall here. Now, you notice it's a basic wall, and uh, this is an instance of this uh, particular type of wall. If I edit the type, I'm going to edit every single instance that is inserted or drawn um, with this family, in place family. Um, and these are the properties of it, but not necessarily all of them. You could add more, but let's go to the type. Now, in type, and this is where I'm going to leave you. Again, this is a, uh, a brick-on-metal stud. It's a brick-on-metal stud. Now, we, don't, we, we can change a lot of the parameters of this wall. And if you look at it, it already has some built in. Well, let's not, get mis let's not go off into space, but as you can see, the analytical properties are pretty robust. Uh, heat... <laughs> is absorption, refraction. There's so many engineering coefficients and variables that you have to think about. Uh, thermal mass, BTUs per uh, degree of Fahrenheit, uh, absor uh, absorptance, uh, heat transfer coefficient, thermal resistance, things like that. Um, assembly description, exterior wall, brick veneer with stud, assembly code, cost, um, and all of these things you'll be able to then extract the information that you need. Wrapping and all this stuff, we have to get to. It's a whole other chapter. But we're going we're gonna to talk about it a little bit. I just want to show you the power of this thing. This is what makes up this wall. These layers. Thermal layer, membrane layer, substrate, core boundary, structure, core boundary, membrane layer, finish. Now, we're going to get into all this. We're going to get into all this. But let's just take a look at... We know that the finish is exterior brick, and it's a 3 and 5 eighths thickness, and we're not going to get into this yet, that's very difficult. Um, but if we could change that, we could change that material. Let's call it birch. <laughs> it's exterior birch. It's going to weather real fast. Huh? Exterior birch. Now, you'll see, and this is another chapter in and of itself, <laughs> that we can do things with this exterior birch that will affect the thickness of the wall. Now, this is where AutoCAD um, is going to fall. It's going to be a distant memory. I'm not going to get into it. But as you can see, there are many more parameters than there are available to you. Um, in any event, I'm not going to get into wrapping. It's very important. Wrapping is very important. Plus, I don't like that music anyway. Anyway, so that's something I wanted to show you because now when I hit OK and I hit Apply, I hit OK. Now, this wall is actually... Let's see if I can get the right display resolution. Did it do it? Yeah, so now, as you can see, it's birch. It's birch. Toodaloo. There's more to this than meets the eye. We have a lot to cover. Again, I'm broke. <laughs> SOS. Hope I recorded. 